Hello, and welcome to this conversation on innovation and the new systemic and infrastructural vulnerabilities. My name is Giovanni De Grandis, and I am the coordinator of the Affino project, and I am based at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Irina Brass. Irina is Associated Professor in Regulation, Innovation and Public Policy at University College London, Departments of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. Her research interests are in the regulation of emerging technologies and the, gov and the governance of responsible innovation. Her most recent research has been in large projects funded by the British Research Council, one on cybersecurity, data protection, and regulatory responsive to disruptive technologies, the other on adaptive regulatory strategies for biotherapeutics, where I have had the pleasure of working with uh, Irina, by the way. Irina works closely with policymakers, as well as national and international standards making bodies. In 2017, she was elected chair of the Internet of Things One Committee at the British Standards Institute. And in 2019, she received the prestigious BSI Standards Maker Award for Education about Standardization. Irina has advised governments and specialist agencies on cybersecurity, data protection, and regulatory responsive to, responses to disruptive technologies. She has a background in public policy, regulation, and standardization, and she holds a PhD in government from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Today, Irina is with us to talk about innovation and new systemic and infrastructural risks and vulnerabilities, the case of cybersecurity, a topic that has occupied her in recent years. So welcome, Irina, and thank you very much for being with us today to share your experience and knowledge. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for inviting me. And uh, also, it's a pleasure to be working with you again. Um, so it's good to see you, and it's good to be part of this project. Thank you very much for inviting me. Our pleasure. Thank you for the nice words. <laughs> so let me uh, start uh, with a question on, uh, uh, on you your main uh, research. So you have done a, a very important work on uh, cybersecurity and the Internet of Things, a technological innovation that has brought with it uh, many opportunities, but also tremendous systemic and infrastructural vulnerabilities. Can you give us an overview of the range and novelty of the vulnerabilities created by the emergency of the Internet of Things? Yes, so this is a very important question, but before I start to talk about the vulnerabilities, I just want to bring us a little bit forward onto understanding what the Internet of Things is. So thank you very much for asking the question, but I want to kind of move it a little slightly on before we talk about vulnerabilities, what it is actually that we are looking at. So we talk about the Internet of Things all the time. It's in the news, it's in everyone's, um, uh, it's in the media, um, it's, it's, it's very much a word of mouth. Um, but uh, at the same time, very few people understand what actually the Internet of Things is. So sometimes we think that the Internet of Things is uh, some smart devices that we introduce. It might be my wristwatch, for instance, that's, that's an IoT device, but it might also be um, something like um, a, a smart kettle. It might also be a smart uh, um, alarm system, so a smart security system for your home. It might also be your new, very innovative fridge. Um, and then moving on to the infrastructure side, it might also be a bunch of sensors, and I will get back to this, uh, that are being placed on critical infrastructures like the um, water and sewage infrastructure, uh, things around uh, the electricity, so smart, the smart grid, etc. So really, when we talk about the IoT, we talk about a, a vast a range of applications and sectors and subsectors that this applies to. So I know that I haven't really explained what the IoT is, and I want to make sure that I do so. Um, because sometimes when we 
talk about the IoT, we tend to look at what happens, what we call in cybersecurity, at the end point. So the interaction that we are having or that particular uh, professionals are having if they are in the critical infrastructure environment with that endpoint device, which is generally a sensor, some form of a sensor or a combination of sensors, something that essentially collects data from us. But that's just the one entry point or the endpoint to a broader system. So in the research that I've been doing, uh, with colleagues in the Petras uh, IoT Research Hub. Uh, so this is the Petras Internet of Things Research Hub in the UK. We tried very much to convey the point from a research perspective that that smart device is just a, an endpoint to a broader infrastructure that happens, uh, that supports communicating and understanding and managing that information that is being um, uh, taken uh, from those particular sensors. So essentially, the way that we defined the IoT is at one end, you have a bunch of sensors that collect data. But because these sensors and these endpoint devices, like my watch, for instance, are actually don't have a lot of compute power, so they cannot compute a lot because if they compute a lot, they will drain the battery. So the, um, uh, the, the solution was to take the data that, that the sensors are, are, are taking it, to use the communication, the information and communication infrastructures that we have. Uh, they can be um, uh, y, uh, w WLANs, so wireless uh, um, uh, device, uh, networks, they can also be uh, communication, so the established communication infrastructures via cellular, etc. And then move the data through this into a cloud, so into your cloud services, and then to process it. And sometimes to go back and actuate, so we, we refer to it as actuation, so once that data is being processed, sometimes we see that uh, something is being done based on that processing of the data. So things like um, make sure that uh, your, I don't know, your washing machine stops at a particular point, or if we move into critical infrastructure, for instance, I want to give an example of, uh, I don't know, uh, Olympic games, when when a particular when when the sun goes in a particular direction then the uh, the shades will move also in a particular direction the shades move because they have sensors on them they tra they transfer the data through the communication infrastructure they process it in the cloud and then they essentially actuate so they tell those sensors back or actuators back what to do, i.e. to move the shades in the direction uh, that is needed so that, for instance, a particular light happens at a particular point in time. So whenever we refer to the IoT, we don't necessarily refer to just that endpoint, i.e. your smartwatch or your kettle or whatever happens in your particular home environment where we've seen the most growth uh, from from the Internet of Things, but it's actually a, 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 a very um, uh, it's a very detailed uh, infrastructure that supports it that has already been there in the past. One of the problems with IoT devices, so now we're moving at the edge, we're moving at the device level, a bit like my watch, right, is because they don't have a lot of compute power and because you can think of my watch, but you can also think of, as I mentioned before, the kettle or the security system in your home, to, be, uh, to make sure that the, security, the cybersecurity of those devices is intact requires a lot of work. And a lot of the devices that we had before were not necessarily um, smart. Uh, so they weren't necessarily uh, 
uh, connected to the internet directly or indirectly. And as a result uh, of that, uh, now we're struggling looking at the very detailed supply chain, which I will uh, hopefully uh, touch upon later on. Um, security, their cybersecurity was not a consideration from the start. So we are now in a situation where a lot of these products are entering the market and they don't have that cybersecurity that otherwise we would like to have. But it has to be understood in the broader picture in the sense that once a particular device has low security vulnerability, it enters that entire process, right? So if you have low security specifications on that one entry point, then potentially you can also exploit, talking about vulnerabilities, you can also exploit that entire network. That's why the IoT is not just what we see, oh, the kettle, the TV, the uh, smart fridge, the smart uh, uh, washing machine, uh, your Roomba in the house that does the cleaning, but it's more, or your and this is more critical, or your uh, uh, toy, for instance, for your children that is now connected to the internet as well. But it's about understanding that entire infrastructure that supports that endpoint. So now moving on to your question, and sorry, I know that this has been a bit long, but moving on to your question about the vulnerabilities, the way that we have structured these vulnerabilities are in two segments looking at new vulnerabilities towards the individual and looking at vulnerabilities towards other types of critical infrastructure, one of which is also the internet, which is a global infrastructure. So I'll focus on these two because I also think that when it comes to critical infrastructures that are supported by IoT, such as our former utilities, there has been quite a lot of work done there. So that's why I want to focus on the individual and then on the critical infrastructure, which is also the internet, which is vulnerable to the IoT. So focusing first on uh, the individual. Let's take one scenario. The scenario that I always use is a, a smart um, a home security system. So this is something where you can see, you know, you've put some cameras in inside and you can see and you can power everything through your, um, through your uh, mobile phone. Um, and for instance, the moment you are within a reach of your property, the, uh, uh, the, the system will tell you that, okay, it's fine, you can enter. So it's all done by, through this communication infrastructure that we're using. If we are using this technology, such as an IoT, so a smart, um, a smart um, uh, home uh, security system, the idea of it, the utility of it, is the fact that it will offer us physical security, right? But what happens actually is that by, by not having cybersecurity, so by not having the cybersecurity of that particular uh, technology, so low passwords or no passwords, very easily accessible passwords, um, or any other type of vulnerability that I will talk about uh, later on as well, if we have time. Um, cyber criminals can come in, can access that, and they will essentially disable your physical security. So they can easily access that property they can endanger your safety. Um, they can also, by just entering through a particular, by, by breaking into that particular endpoint that I mentioned earlier, they can also enter into and discover from afar. They don't have to be present. Uh, they can also um, uh, discover information about any other home security devices that you might have, for instance, uh, 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 an Alexa, um, uh, which, which ultimately provides 
uh, information to your bank accounts, so financial details, etc. So that's an entry point into your entire ecosystem of digital devices uh, through that particular endpoint into your hub within the home. So this essentially endangers at an individual level, not only their cyber security, but also their physical security, their safety, their data protection rights, and sometimes in extreme cases, which uh, one of our colleagues, Leonie Tanser, also looked at, the surveillance of that, that particular individual, which can also lead into abuse. So looking at one vulnerability that comes from cybersecurity into a broader environment and understanding what just happens at an individual level within the home explains that particular critical aspect about vulnerabilities from the IoT at, at, at the individual level. Moving forward very quickly at the infrastructure level, and again here I'm just focusing at the one infrastructure that people don't think of that much when it comes to the effects of the IoT on the internet, so the effects of the, on the internet of things on the internet infrastructure itself, which more and more supports the socioeconomic activity that we are doing in our day-to-day -day basis. So we are relying on the internet, but the internet is also a very global infrastructure. So putting a lot of devices, people, people essentially putting a lot of devices in their home, a lot of IoT devices in their home, a lot of kettles, a lot of uh, smart watches, a lot of whatever it is, that have low cybersecurity uh, uh, configurations, that means that they're very susceptible to those devices being used to, uh, to, to essentially run some DDoS attacks, so run distributed denial of service attacks on part of the internet infrastructure on another part of the world. So you can essentially target a part of the internet infrastructure like it happened with Mirai. So the reason why I uh, termed this, this talk, um, wh what can we do about Mirai is essentially, we have this particular problem that we had with Mirai in 2016, whereas a bunch of IoT devices, mostly, um, CCTV cameras um, uh, deployed in, in home environments, not, not centralized. Um, uh, TVs, uh, shower heads, smart shower heads were used all over the world to essentially bring down part of the internet infrastructure on the, um, on the west coast of the United States, the Dyne, so the dime part of the infrastructure, which brought down a lot of the services that people relied on. I mean, these are not necessarily the most important ones. If you think, okay, uh, uh, accessing New York Times, uh, Amazon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, they are quite important things for our socioeconomic activity on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's just doing it by utilizing very, very um, easily accessible devices that didn't have the correct password. So here I just presented maybe a bit in a long way two quintessential vulnerabilities, one to the individual, to the individual's security, safety, data protection, um, uh, potential exposure to abuse, and also um, a particular vulnerability that the IoT introduces to the, in, to the infrastructure that, that supports it ultimately. Thank you very much for this uh, very thorough introduction. Uh, can you perhaps just say a, a few words about the, the Mirai case for those who are not uh, familiar with it? Yeah, so the Mirai case happened in 2016, in October 2016. I remember it because that's when I started my uh, my my uh, uh, postdoc job at uh, at the Petras Internet of Things, and it it sort of happened um, 
at the at the right time for our study, but but it also showed the extent of those vulnerabilities that are were already just in 2016 very much present. So as I mentioned before, the Mirai attack was a, a, an attack that used um, low security uh, connected devices uh, like uh, CCTV cameras within people's homes, um, um, uh, TVs, uh, shower heads, whatever, all connected to the internet uh, that were essentially used to power a DDoS attack on the dying infrastructure. The reason why this happened were because a lot of the devices that we still see at the moment um, do not have a very basic functionality to provide security of those devices, which is passwords that are not default. So a lot of IoT devices have default passwords. They do not have, uh, and by IoT devices, I mean products, right? Because sometimes we refer to IoT devices in our speak, in the cybersecurity speak, but what it means is literally some, some products that, you're, that are connected that you bring into your home. So all, all of those had no pass, password protection that you could amend. They came with default passwords like admin, admin, 12345, and you couldn't even change those. Again, if you were to have identified something, you couldn't even get in touch with the manufacturer of that device. And in a lot of cases, the manufacturers the, of those devices actually went out of business very quickly. So there is actually no liability involved there as well. There is no way to actually go back and track who are, um, who are the manufacturers? You can track who are the manufacturers, but what can they do to support you when it comes to that? Very importantly also, when those devices are used for things like a DDoS attack like Mirai, um, the consumer is very unaware that their device was compromised. So you keep using that device thinking that, okay, it operates perfectly fine in, in, my, in my home. There is, n there is no way to know that that device was compromised and was used for, to essentially bring down another, uh, 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 another part of the internet infrastructure or whatever else you wanna do. You can, you can target critical infrastructures that are based on our our utilities, right? So that, that the support our our utilities, which is a lot more critical if we think about it than maybe Amazon getting access to Amazon or uh, reading your news on New York Times. But that's but but the point of cyber criminals is also to prove that point, right? It's not it's it's not necessarily to say I'm gonna bring something down. It's to say this is the capability that you have introduced in the system and it's so easily done. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> quite impressive how this uh, proliferation of, uh, of being connected, not only by, of human beings, but also of artifacts, uh, is also a proliferation of uh, vulnerabilities. And, uh, and, and also it's uh, quite, shocking the the pace i, I mean what you said about uh, these uh, these companies uh, appearing and, and disappearing uh, brings me to to my next question that is uh, uh, about the speed of uh, of this innovation because in in my perception uh, uh, a big challenge for the internet of things and cybersecurity is the high speed of, of innovation and uh, a business environment uh, that emphasizing being fast and being first uh, over being uh, prudent and, um, and considerate. Uh, I think that most of us uh, are familiar with uh, Mark Zuckerberg's motto, move fast and break things, and then you apologize uh, later. Uh, but how can technologies and networks developed so fast and so recklessly ever be regulated and security guaranteed? So um, 
This is a very important question. And I would like, again, to maybe break it into two things. So the first thing is, so by the way, I'm, 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 without sounding like I'm, I'm defending uh, someone like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, which I'm not, um, I think that that particular um, uh, motto, as you, you called it, uh, move fast, break things, is something that to a certain extent should be encouraged if it's understood in a particular mindset, which is move fast, break it, learn from it, and then introduce it in the market. So if that's the approach, then that makes perfect sense. If the approach is move fast, break things, see what happens, and then it's already in the market, then not so much, right? We're not talking about responsible innovation anymore. The, the reason why I wanted to, to break this in, in, in two is ultimately the fact that, at least from my perspective, um, the, um, the IoT shows not so much uh, a particular type of innovation that happened quickly, breaking things, uh, move on, but it actually happens in a very complex and global supply chain. So here we're talking about the resilience of our global economy, our global infrastructures, things that are more just what happens in a jurisdiction. And I think that this is what happened in part with the IoT. So if, for instance, we look at why it is that we have a lot of devices out there that have poor security specifications. So generally we refer to poor security specifications of having um, default passwords, as I mentioned before, um, as having um, no way to essentially contact that particular uh, manufacturer uh, to report a vulnerability. Uh, and also um, uh, to not have a particular uh, time frame with which, within which that device is covered from a cybersecurity perspective, as you would have for the safety of that device. So these are the three main known vulnerabilities that we are experiencing at the moment with the IoT. But the reason why this happens is because we are looking at global supply chain that operates at the margin. So one of the papers that myself and uh, one of my colleagues in the US, uh, Dr. Jesse Sowell, have uh, just published is looking at the adaptive governance mechanisms to deal with these cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And one of the things that we identified and we spoke, spoke about before we even wrote this paper uh, was really understanding what happens at the, at the supply chain, at the global supply chain. So if you have a manufacturer, let's take one very basic example. You have a manufacturer of a teddy bear that has been a manufacturer of a teddy bear for years and say that they are not necessarily in the UK or uh, uh, in a particular juris in the jurisdiction that you're, you're, you're uh, looking at. In most cases, when we talk about toys, they're not necessarily manufactured uh, uh, in, in, in Europe or in the UK or in the United States, etc. They're mostly manufactured in China, in India, in some, some other parts of the world. So for that particular manufacturer, they operate at such a such tight margin that embedding uh, smartness, embedding that, 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 that um, connectivity into, the, into that teddy bear gives them a little bit of that, that margin that otherwise they wouldn't have. So there is that incentive there for them to actually do that. It makes sense for their business. What doesn't make sense for the business is to really invest in cybersecurity because cybersecurity is expensive. Investing in software updates, making sure that the software that you're using in that smart toy, that smart teddy bear or that smart doll or whatever it is, is actually the latest and the most secure one also means that you will have to pay that cost. So you can see in the, just from that first instance in a, in a 
very much more uh, uh, difficult and elaborate supply chain. How just that particular uh, entity, the manufacturer, sees a benefit in embedding connectivity into their otherwise physical device, physical um, uh, toys, uh, whatever it is, um, products, and, and, and then not necessarily wanting to invest in cybersecurity because probably that's not going to give them any, any margin. So just looking at that, we can see where why it is that we're looking not necessarily at move fast, move slow, uh, sorry, move fast, break things, but actually moving fast because that's the way that supply chains, we, 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 we have done supply chains in, 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 in a very, very long global supply chains for, for a while now. So this is not so much about a particular company I have my own issues with, with Facebook, but that's for a different uh, discussion altogether. But uh, when it comes to looking at why we're seeing these vulnerabilities, the situation is a lot more complex than just looking at one entity. It's not just looking at what happens at, at the provision point, but it's actually understanding what happens in the supply chain. What you said uh, made me think about another thing uh, that I want to ask you about. It seems that cybersecurity is one of those things that costs in terms of term, in terms of time and investment, but is not perceived as an added value by the consumer. So is it the case that with a lot of this uh, innovation, consumers do not perceive the difference between something which is uh, responsibly developed and something which is just uh, developed in a in a reckless way yeah so again this is a very important question i think that consumer awareness and 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 i i'm not a huge believer in the in the frame educating consumers because i think that consumers can be quite aware um but, but it's about building that awareness. So for instance, this is where cybersecurity um, is different from safety. So when, for a very long time, and we had this discussion before as well, Giovanni, for a very long time, we look at the safety. So, so consumer safety is at, at the quintessential, um, at the core, right of of why it is that we have regulations in the first place um ensuring that our consumers our citizens whatever it is are are protected is is one of the key considerations to what we have why we have risk regulation now for a very long time consumers have been aware and educated again I'm, I'm trying to be aware of, of utilizing this term education of consumers, but ultimately it is this, of, of those particular vulnerabilities that physical products might have. Hence why we built this, um, this uh, regulatory frame, these very detailed regulatory frameworks for, for different products. And again, they, they range from uh, consumer, your general consumer products, to cars, to uh, the, the, the things that we looked at, which are yeah, pharmaceuticals and then these new therapies, et cetera, when we're looking at the efficacy, we're looking at the safety of, of those particular therapies. Now, now we've introduced this, this new um, uh, functionality into our devices, which is the fact that they're connected, but we haven't necessarily told the consumer what that means and what they should be aware of. And just presuming that because we, they understand safety, they know where to look for safety, they know that they should be looking for a particular label, they know that this has been regulated, right? The safety of products has been regulated for 20 odd years, if not more, in the, in the EU, in the US, in other parts of the world, and it's also part of the 
international um, trade uh, uh, agreements when it comes to product safety. So we should be expecting that. At the same time, consumers, th there is no such thing for cybersecurity. So consumers do not necessarily understand what it is to, where, where they should be looking at. What, what is that makes a particular product cyber secure or insecure? What it is that they should be doing to look into that? And then there is another question, which I bet that you are gonna ask next, which is, is it really the responsibility of consumers to be looking for this stuff anyways? Because the way that we've done the safety regulatory frameworks in the past is to do a lot of ex ante controls so that we ensure that the consumers are safe, they can look at the label, they can read it, but the label essentially proves that that particular uh, device is, is safe. Can we do the same for cybersecurity? I would argue no, n because of the nature of cybersecurity, but there are ways around it, that we can go around it. But indeed, when it comes to consumer protection and consumer awareness, consumers are not aware of the vulnerabilities that ultimately they're bringing into their home, A, because they haven't been communicated to them, and also because this is, this is an area that, 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 that has just sprung on us, right? We, we, uh, we now have uh, security update software updates on our uh, laptops that are just pushed through as opposed to relying on the consumer to click the button, which we know that sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But now, for instance, if you leave your, your, your laptop open, that security update is going to be, so that software update is going to be pushed through by the manufacturer. The same thing needs to happen with these devices. It's just because of that global supply chain and because of looking at that particular individual, of that particular entity, that manufacturer, that really operates at the margin, you can understand why that can be very costly. It can work for a Dell, it can work for a Mac, it can work for, I don't wanna uh, advertise particular companies here, but it can work for the big players, but it cannot work for your teddy bear manufacturer. They cannot push those through, they will run out of business. So the, the picture that you are, have given us is one very challenging for uh, responsible research and, uh, and, and innovations because we, we not only have uh, uh, technologies that are disruptive in the sense that they are introducing new kinds of, uh, of possibilities, but also of, of risks and, and vulnerabilities, but there are also very complex uh, uh, supply chains that are uh, uh, introducing uh, risks and vulnerabilities at, at, at different uh, um, levels and that can move uh, along the system uh, uh, exploiting the, the weakest links. So is there a, a viable uh, model for uh, responsible research and innovation that can be applied to, to cyber technologies with this level of uh, interconnectedness and interdependence and with low margins that a lot of players are operating within? So there are a few options. They're not necessarily perfect in themselves, but there are different options that are already coming up. So one of them is, of course, to, to, to look at, so rather than regulate, to look at what an expert community is doing, um, uh, bringing experts from industry, from academia, from consumer associations within the standardization community. You mentioned that at the start that I have an interest in, um, in this space and I do indeed, and I'm very active in that space as well. And that's because for a lot of 
uh, entities that are operating in this market, it makes sense to look at how do you, where can you essentially uh, purchase or not even purchase, but where can you access a, a, a particular baseline, which is a standard, the standard is ultimately a baseline of what responsible at that point might look like. So where they can access this particular standard, this consensus knowledge that a bunch of experts have come together and produced in terms of what is needed for, 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 uh, uh, for them to ensure a basic security. And I have to say this responsible baseline security um, rather than basic. So I, I have, through my interactions at the BSI, I've seen a lot, and I have to say that this is promising. I've seen a lot of SMEs, uh, so a lot of small, uh, medium enterprises that are very much keen on making sure that their products, which beforehand were just physical, for instance, I don't know, uh, your typical alarm in your home that wasn't necessarily connected to the internet, to now making sure that they don't lose out and they don't um, endanger their reputation in any way. So that's the first thing. There is, there is good input from the, um, uh, from the small and medium sized business environment for their essentially willingness and keenness to uh, to embed their devices with also that, that baseline cybersecurity requirement. And organizations like national standards bodies in the UK, the BSI, um, regional standards bodies like uh, Etsy, for instance, in the EU and others in the US, uh, NIST in the US, for instance, are very much working on making sure that, that at least a baseline is communicated and is easily accessible to that community. There are also other initiatives that we are seeing, for instance, the UK government, DCMS, so this is the department, uh, it's a ministry, so the Department of um, Digital Communication, uh, Digital uh, Culture, Media and Sport, but it deals with digital, um, have produced a uh, code of practice. They were one of the first uh, governments in the world to produce a code of practice that essentially tackled, they tackled 11 issues, but they tackled these three issues that I mentioned before, which is default passwords, the fact that you must communicate if there is a vulnerability for a, for a security, cybersecurity researcher, they should be able to communicate the vulnerability to the manufacturer and the fact that there is a span that is being provided to the consumer of what the uh, software updates are so that, so that the consumer and everyone else, like the retailer, for instance, knows what that, uh, what that uh, coverage is for, right? Um, and other issues. So we've seen that now the, uh, the, the, the UK government, DCMS is looking into making those three um, uh, principles from the code of practice, which was uh, of course a voluntary one into regulation. So they're looking into regulating. So introducing a regulation for IOT for these uh, three issues. Um, and there are other initiatives around the world, but these are some of the most iconic ones. Now, from a, from a researcher perspective, as someone who has also worked with, with, with DCMS as part of this pro process, um, I have to say that I think that to a certain extent, this is understanding cybersecurity as safety where you can introduce some ex ante things without necessarily considering what's happening afterwards and without really understanding the dynamic nature of security, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is insanely dynamic. So just taking from Mirai, moving from that particular uh, um, example that I gave you from 2016, the Mirai attack, the DDoS attack, since then, uh, my colleague from the US who does cybersecurity, uh, not from a 
policy and regulatory perspective, but from a technical perspective, has told me that there have been a number of variations on the, the, the Mirai code that was released on the internet where different um, uh, 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 cyber criminal networks have essentially attacked each other's on, on, this, on this particular code um, and always improving on it. So cybersecurity is not like safety, where, whereas, for instance, if you're looking at the safety of a car, you're thinking, okay, what does the airbag, what is the air in a volume uh, in that particular airbag that has to happen so that if I bash the car against the wall and if I have the dummy, there's no spine, um, uh, no substantial spine damage that will happen so that that person that's driving will will uh, um, will, will lose their life or whatever will be endangered in some important manner. Cybersecurity is not like this. Cybersecurity is insanely dynamic. Once we will deal with things like no uh, default passwords, so this is this is what we're looking at at the moment. In the next year, we might be looking at something completely different. So understanding and being able to adapt to this new environment where these risks that are associated with these technologies are also very dynamic and ever changing requires a change of how we deal with standards and also uh, how we produce and update them, and also how we look at regulation. So what I'm looking at and what my colleague and I have been looking at from, from the US, Dr. Uh, Jesse Sowell and myself have been looking at, is looking at what are some of the more adaptive ways in which we can create risk regulatory regimes. Uh, so here we're looking at some established epistemic communities of cybersecurity experts that can provide that they are essentially looking for those vulnerabilities they are looking for the kind of abuse and by the way i mean abuse here in the very broad way so um we're looking here at any kind of spam for instance is a type of abuse so we're not looking at those extreme cases but any anything that essentially is trying to extract something from you is a form of abuse in some security terms so we're looking at those communities and the expertise and the knowledge by just looking at network traffic that they can provide and then inform the regulators. This, of course, comes with challenges in terms of how we adapt the regulatory frameworks. Again, spoke too much. I will stop here. No, but that was really uh, important and interesting. Well, uh, what I think is uh, really challenging from what you said is that this uh, very high dynamic environment makes it almost impossible for uh, uh, responsibility to, to be only delegated to, to regulations and, and standards because things are, are always uh, moving on and, uh, and standards and regulations uh, are struggling to, to catch up. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned these uh, elements of uh, adaptive uh, uh, governance and adaptive regulation because this is becoming uh, an increasingly uh, popular uh, uh, model. Uh, but is this a, a feasible model of risk regulation and control? Because uh, according to the critics, uh, uh, this is almost a, an admission of impotence and a capitulation. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we cannot anticipate and foresee all the risk and the vulnerabilities in, in advance. So my, my question here is, uh, uh, what are, in your opinion, the essential features of a, of a life cycle management that really works? It is not just a, 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 an acquiescent deferral of responsibility. It's something that can make us feel confident that we will be protected. Yeah, so this is a very good question. And if I had the exact answer, I would probably be uh, 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 you know, one of those guys that are running the move fast and break things, um, but I'm not. Um, and I also don't necessarily know if I wanted to go in that direction. That was just a joke. 
Um, but um, yeah, so what can we do when we move from an ex ante um, uh, regulatory model to more of a balanced ex ante and ex post with m m potentially a bit more responsibility on the ex post regulatory framework when it comes to risk regulation. Um, there are a, a few things that I think we can ensure. So that baseline of what makes good practice uh, can happen at the ex ante regulate and any ex ante regulatory framework. So by the way, I'm, I'm uh, to make a parenthesis on this point. Um, I do not necessarily think that uh, at this point in time, when it comes to the IoT, and I'm here, I'm just referring to the IoT, um, jurisdictional responses are the best way forward. Um, because of the supply chain issues, it's very difficult to actually control that. And it's also very uh, difficult to convey that to the consumer. You cannot just put a label as you do with safety, for instance, for the consumer. So we have to be a bit more innovative there. But from the regulatory perspective, and here I'm just thinking mostly at the regulators and their uh, close stakeholders, so industry, other entities that are using that technology, not so much the consumer for this particular question, although of course the consumer is always, always important because we're doing all of this for, for consumers, right? Um, it's a matter of making sure that your regulatory frameworks are flexible enough to allow for new information coming in. So this is not to say that you have to um, necessarily change that particular regulatory framework, that you, but, but that you have to create the regulatory capacity so that Whenever we're talking about epistemic communities that hold that particular information. Now, you and I are part of science, technology, engineering, and public policy, that particular department, which we're trying to do just that, right? How do we take that particular expertise that rests in communities that are quite dispersed and bring them so that they inform policy? That's step number one, but how do we make sure that they continue to do that? So that that particular regulatory framework continues to be informed by new knowledge, new vulnerability, uh, or any other incidents that are occurring from a cybersecurity perspective, so that we create a framework, but then the principles, the requirements that are embedded in that framework can be easily adapted and communicated to that um, to the other stakeholders so that they can implement this. So this is a completely new way that we rethink regulatory governance, where it's no longer about what should the regulator do? Should the regulator look at all the ex ante requirements that are needed? Should the regulator tell um, uh, the direct stakeholders what they should do exposed when it comes to ensuring that those particular products or whatever it is are safe, secure, et cetera, et cetera. So it's less along this route and more along the route of how can we, how can we create a regulatory governance environment where uh, this, this is an easily, um, uh, this is a dialogue that is being is that is being established and is being information and knowledge is being easily communicated and implemented. It's not going to be perfect, but it requires a lot of rethinking about the capabilities that regulators have, a lot of um, rethinking about the interaction that should happen between the regulators and the regulatees so that capture also doesn't happen because that also brings, opens the discussion to, to uh, and opens opportunity to potentially capture. Um, but, there, but there are a lot of dynamics that can be introduced so that we create baselines, so we create frameworks, and then we make sure that 
we create those channels so new information can funnel in and then funnel out. It's just a way of rethinking the regulatory process. But do you think that uh, creating this capacity for, for this uh, sort of uh, ongoing work that is uh, always an unfinished business uh, is, is, is possible or is it something that is uh, too costly and, and is a cost that is very difficult to uh, make uh, citizens perceive the uh, the reason why we, we need to have such uh, big agencies with a lot of capacity, with a lot of people uh, uh, employed to do what? So, so again, how much uh, is, is, is it a matter to, to make people perceive the importance of having these, uh, these systems of, uh, of governance in place in order to, to make them work? So here I, I do have a very straightforward answer. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, give a very long, uh, long answer as I did before. When we started safety regulations, for instance, if we look at the vehicle, we looked at just the seatbelt and just implementing the seatbelt as a requirement took a very long time ago. 15 years, if I'm not mistaken, to create that regulatory uh, uh, framework around it and for people to also accept and implement it and to accept the fact that that kind of regulatory framework is needed for their safety. So to me, the way that I'm looking at it is this is not something that we haven't done in the past. The question is more on the political side, which is, what do politicians, and I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a politician, I don't want to get into the politics of it, um, but what is it that the, where the politicians see the trajectory for things? So if the politics is keep, keep regulation, keep the state uh, small, then of course we're going to get, and that's the mentality and that's the philosophy, and this is something that is being communicated to consumers, then of course we're going to see the, 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 those, those responses. But in my view, ensuring good cybersecurity regulatory frameworks that are adaptive enough um, is not something that we have not seen in the past, maybe not in the same way that we would do them, but when it comes to the same capacity requirements, then absolutely so. In order to ensure all of that, 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 that all of that ex ante regulation, all of that pre-market authorization uh, requests occur, that requires a lot of regulatory capacity, which a lot of regulators have already. So this is not something that we're not familiar with, and we benefit from that. Consumers have benefited tremendously from that. So it's a matter to me more of how you communicate it than the actual capacity requirements that might lead to the politics of, of that um, uh, and discussions and debates around the politics of that. I mean, we see the same with a lot of other issues. We see the, the, the same situation now with COVID-19. We see this, we've, we've seen the same situation with the GDPR, with the General Data Protection Regulation, where just a simple information campaign from the European Commission about the importance of these of, of data protection and moving it to a regulation, which is by no means perfect, uh, have resulted in a lot of acceptance from from consumers, from uh, within the EU, but also from other jurisdictions to understand and be aware and to try to emulate, also to harmonize, but but try to emulate that. So it's not impossible. But it takes a bit of vision. It takes people who have the courage of pushing uh, things forward. Yeah. yeah. Of <laughs> That's a bit of a hopeful message. Good. <laughs> uh, but let me just close very quickly with with a question. Since you have managed, uh, since you have mentioned um, the COVID nineteen situation. Uh, 
what do you think has been uh, the the impact of this crisis on on people uh, awareness uh, of the uh, vulnerabilities of of digital technologies because everybody has been uh, using them so much more during the the lockdown it, they have been sort of uh, life saving uh, all our social life a lot of our work and uh, things have have been uh, possible only thanks to to digital technologies but do you think that people uh, therefore have become more aware of how much dependent they are now on these technologies and therefore how they need to to make sure that they are uh, uh, safe and secure or do you think that this uh, feeling of dependency uh, has made people oblivious of any need to to regulating and made them uh, uh, secure because uh, uh, there's, no, there's no time to do that we, we just uh, need them and uh, and take a, take them as they are so this is a very very big question and to a certain extent i don't have all of the answers because i haven't necessarily been involved so much on the technical side of what happened with covid 19 in particular when it comes to track and trace um there are a few colleagues at ucl like michael uh, dr michael veal from the department of laws who has done a lot of work here um, but so again, there are two, two legs to your question. The first is, have we become more dependent on these digital technologies? Yes. Um, are we more aware of the security vulnerabilities? I would say no. Um, in the sense that we rely on them. We've kind of always relied on them uh, even before COVID-19 now more. I don't necessarily think that there has been an increase, uh, and this is just anecdotal, just because I, I haven't done any sort of systematic study to understand whether that's the case or not, but just by looking at, at trends, I don't necessarily think that people have understood, or and by people I mean organizations as well as individuals, understood the security vulnerabilities that are also associated with um, uh, running a lot of conferences online. Um, there are always, for instance, uh, again, as an anecdote, pins that are being given that are not even utilized because you can just enter that particular discussion. So you don't know necessarily who's in and who's out of that discussion unless you are very aware of who's monitoring it. So I don't necessarily think that on that side much has changed in the sense that We've always increasingly in the past 10 years relied on digital technologies. Now it's just a little bit more, but when it comes to their vulnerabilities, probably not. Um, when it comes to using uh, information and communication technologies for track and trace for COVID and other types of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, similar pandemics or whatever it is, um, I'd say that it depends very much, and one of the one of the main controversies has been whether to go for a centralized or a decentralized trick and trace system. So, for instance, in the UK, the proposal initially was for a centralized system run by the NHS that was scraped off. In other parts of the the world, uh, um, in other parts of Europe, Germany, etc., they went for a decentralized system where essentially. Um, you would be able to exchange location information from one person to another, and then you would be notified if that particular person um, has been exposed or not to, and that's one way of, of, of managing it without necessarily centralizing the, the, the data and the information. So that's my understanding of it. Um, that being said, I'm not sure how successful either of these systems have been so far in the sense that both um, and all track and trace systems rely actually on a lot of uh, human resource uh, in the sense that there is a lot of, of, of monitoring, a lot of calling, a lot of, so that, that has been heavy, not so much on the digital side. That's not to say that we're not moving into that realm and it can be done very easily in a way that doesn't store a lot of data and we don't go into a surveillance state. It can be done. 
The question is, what, what is the alternative? And the alternative that was proposed for a decentralized system was the one that Apple and Google proposed. So it's always the trade-off. With everything, I always refer in terms of trade-off. Is it the surveillance state or is it the powerful companies that essentially, ultimately, propose that technology it might work, it might not be intrusive now, but it could be intrusive in the future. So the question is not necessarily what technology, but who manages it and what is the, its future. And that's the politics of it again. And I think not only the, the politics, but uh, this is a, a very great example of sometimes how sometimes it can be really hard to understand uh, what is the responsible innovation. So <laughs> is it more responsible to, uh, to trust uh, uh, the state or uh, to trust uh, a big company? And uh, sometimes the, the trade-off uh, is not completely clear what could be the, the future implications, right? Exactly. Oh, well, with this big uh, <laughs> issue, I, I think that we have to come to a close uh, for our, of our conversation because uh, you have to, to go, I guess. But thank you so much for uh, having been with us and having shared your uh, remarkable uh, experience and, uh, and expertise. It was really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Always a pleasure to talk to you. We always have the most fascinating discussions. So I look forward to some of them in the future and I look forward to be part of the conference. Thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, uh, see you uh, on, the, on the webinar in the, in the panel discussion. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Goodbye, Irina. Bye. Bye, Giovanni. Thank you.